um, in honor of the unusual layout of the room, I have uh, worn this rather fine shirt, and I'll be doing the entire talk in the style of a best man giving a speech. So I've converted it into anecdotes that will be embarrassing for quantum Latin squares. Um, no, that's not at all true. Um, except for one part, I am actually wearing this shirt. But um, apart from that, no, it will be a standard talk. Um, yeah, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce you to uh, a topic that has been very much on my mind for quite a long time now, uh, and a result that I think is, is quite neat um, and elegant. Um, I'm going to be presenting it in a style that's slightly different to how it's written in the actual paper, but it's more in line with how we actually came, about, came, came up with these results to begin with. Um, so, yeah, the title of the talk is Quantum Latin Squares and Unitary Error Bases. Um, and I'll be going on to both of those uh, in due course. Um, it's a paper by myself and uh, Jamie Vickery, who's not here today, um, both from Oxford. And um, I'm going to be using the traditional Oxford yellow for this. So, <laughs> right, moving right along. Um, so, um, just, uh, I'll just say a few words uh, about each of these quantum Latin squares and unitary error bases before I get started and talk in more detail about what they are. Um, so some of you may be familiar with unitary error bases. They're otherwise known as uh, unitary operator bases or simply operator bases uh, since operators are assumed to be unitary anyway. Uh, they're essentially a kind of higher order tensor analog of what we all know of uh, as a, an orthonormal basis, a standard orthonormal basis, but brought up to the level where the basis states are matrices. So I'll, I'll go, I'll talk about that um, at the time. Quantum Latin squares are unlikely to be familiar to any of you unless you've read this paper because we are introducing these here. Um, so, uh, but Latin squares maybe, and uh, and that's what I'll that's what I'll start with here. So. A Latin square, uh, for those of you who have not come across these combinatorial objects, is uh, it's an n by n grid. And we have n symbols to put into this grid. And the rule is, on every row and every column, we have to insert each symbol just once. So every row and every column is a permutation of these symbols. <coughs> OK, so what does that look like? So on the left, here at the bottom, we have, oh, can I point it out? Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, a four by four Latin square. So you can see every number only appears once in every row and column. And um, so Latin squares have been used extensively in uh, quantum information stuff. Um, the various, uh, various constructions and, and, and protocols. And the way to make this into something that looks like it could be a bit more relevant to quantum mechanics is to interpret each of these numbers as a basis state of the computational basis by simply taking them, putting a cat around them. So, uh, so now we have uh, this quantum Latin square on the <coughs> right-hand side, which at least for the rest of this talk I will take as a sort of primitive. That's what I mean by a quantum. By a, sorry, I, I might have said quantum then. No quantum yet, just Latin square. Okay, so this is a Latin square. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Great. So, oh, that one works better. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, moving on uh, to quantum Latin squares, which unsurprisingly do have something to do with these Latin squares. Uh, so, a quantum Latin square is similar. It's an it's an n by n grid. But now, in each entry in this grid is no longer just some symbol or or just a cat uh, computational basis state. It's now a general vector. So it's a general normalized vector such that in each column and each row, we have uh, an orthonormal basis. So if we, if we just go back and look at this, clearly this Latin square obeys these rules. It is a quantum Latin square, but, um, and, and any Latin square will be. But now we're allowing um, for a bit more freedom. And so, for example, something like this with superpositions in it. And if you can check that quickly, <laughs> it, <laughs> every row and every column is an orthonormal basis. 
So this is also a quantum Latin square, which is obviously not a Latin square. OK, so, so we've introduced this thing. And um, the way that I want to um, interpret this in Hilbert space uh, and get a linear map out of this, I want to encode this into a particular linear map, uh, which I will denote by a tensor diagram. So, so we take our quantum Latin square, and we label the rows and columns by the computational basis states. And we're going to interpret this as some tensor here where I'm reading from bottom to top. And so it's a two in, one out. Each of these, in this case, is the Hilbert space C4, but in general, C to the N. Um, and the way this encoding will work is if we imagine plugging in computational basis states on the left leg here, then that corresponds to the columns. And the right leg corresponds to the rows. And so if we plug in, say, <coughs> 1 and 3, then we should get the 1, 3 entry here, and we get 2. That's how this is going to work. And, and so these triangular little tensors here with 0 in and 1 out, we can, um, we can interpret those as column vectors, as states. Okay. Uh, so another example, if we take 2 and 1, then we get this superposition, which is this entry here. OK, so we've encoded the data from our quantum Latin square, uh, or also Latin square, since they're quantum Latin squares too, into this tensor over here. Now, uh, I want to introduce a way of similarly encoding uh, the basis in which it's written into a tensor. Uh, and then say something about the properties of Latin squares in terms of those two tensors. Um, OK. So, yeah. So, this here, this is going to represent a Latin square, OK? A quantum Latin square, rather. So, this grid here, the data from it. Yeah. So, the map. Which map? You mean? What does this symbol mean? This, one is dead. this symbol. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean anything in particular. It just means that I'm this. This you can see this as a kind of multiplication because it's two in, one out, right? And this is the multiplication table for it. It's it's not an actual map. It's just another way of denoting the quantum Latin square. You don't see how all the data from this can be put into this. Is that the problem? Or? Okay. Yeah, so, so in this case, so we could imagine that if there was a symmetry down this line, for example, then, then it would be commutative and you could swap these legs over and it would make no difference. In the general case, it's not going to be commutative. So a line down the middle will make a difference to this, yeah. Um, and we can, we can also take uh, the adjoint of this map and, and write it upside down, uh, and that, that will work. That will give us, if we put a state in, that will give us the superposition of wherever that state occurs in the table. Okay, and that's something we will actually use as well. OK, so um, now I want to introduce this, this idea of a basis uh, in, in, in the tensor form. So given some basis for a Hilbert space, i ranging through 0 to n minus 1, we can define the following two maps. OK, so the top of these two maps um, I want to describe as a kind of compare map. So these triangles in here, now these two are effects, and that one is a state. And these are just the, these basis states here, so these i's. And so the, it ranges through all the basis states. And it might not be entirely clear, but if you think about it for a while, what you get when you plug in some states from the same basis into the bottom of this <coughs> is you get out either 0 if those states are different or that state if the states are the same. And conversely, the adjoint of that down here, which I would like to call copy, if you plug in, say, n, then you will get out two copies of n 
here. Okay, so I've introduced, so you can see that given any basis, these are maps that you could define. And it, it turns out that conversely, these maps, if you, if you compose these maps in, in any way, any number of these, and you just count the numbers of legs in and the numbers of legs out, then that uniquely defines uh, a particular linear map. And that property, and this is a non-trivial fact, it's not supposed to be obvious, that property um, uniquely <coughs> defines the basis. So the bases are in one-to-one -one correspondence with these, in this case, gray dots. So these dots have a lot more structure to them than, for example, this white dot here, which is not commutative, it's not even associative. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of structure, whereas these are commutative, they're certainly associative. You can very simply prove um, various properties about this. So there's a lot of packed into this, but, um, but they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with bases, and I'm going to use the gray dot generally to represent the computational basis states. Okay. So um, in terms of these tensors which I've introduced here, MUBs have a nice characterization. And what I'm going towards here is, um, on the next slide, I'm going to show what quantum Latin squares are uh, in terms of these tensors. And I'm going to show what Latin squares are, and I'm going to show what MUBs are. And hopefully it will become clear what the relationship between the three is. Um, so MUBs have been mentioned a bit this week um, already. Here's the general definition that a lot of you will probably be familiar with. Um, if you're not, then generally what a MUB is if, is if you a couple of you've got two orthonormal bases. Uh, in this case, I mean they don't have to be, but in this case, I'm assuming orthonormality. Um, and you take one basis state of one and with a basis state of the other, and take the inner product, and square that, then you get this constant, which is one over the dimension. Uh, in a sense, they're bases which are as far away apart from each other as they can be. Okay, now I have this theorem, which if we take these, this gray dot and this white dot to be orthonormal bases now, in the sense of the last slide, then the bases being mutually unbiased is exactly the same as this composite linear map here, being unitary up to a constant. Okay, so this, in terms of this diagrammatic tensor way of writing things, precisely captures the idea of mutually unbiasedness. Um, and I think I just learned yesterday that this could be called an MPO. Um, I learned it from this guy here, Martin, what, during his poster talk. Uh, so I'm just going to throw that in there to see if anybody knows what that is. If you don't, don't worry about it. Um, okay, so, um, so now I want to show uh, what a quantum Latin square, Latin square, and an MUB are axiomatized um, with respect to this gray basis. So this gray will now be the computational basis. You can think of that as the computational basis. This white, I'm giving no structure whatsoever to begin with. It's just some linear map um, that is, I mean, it's necessarily from this Hilbert space tensored with itself to another. But other than that, I'm not telling you anything about it. And for this white uh, dot to be a quantum Latin square in the same sense that I defined earlier algebraically, all we need is for these two composite maps to be unitary. <coughs> Okay, well, this should start to look a little bit um, familiar from the way I um, just defined MUBs graphically, um, and that's all going to come together in a second. And that is actually the only axiom that this white dot needs to obey in order to be a quantum Latin square. So this axiom here is exactly equivalent to the rows and columns being orthonormal bases. That's not entirely obvious necessarily, but that is the case. Okay, now if I introduce, reintroduce Latin squares in, in this uh, diagrammatic way, then we have, of course, the same axiom because Latin squares 
have orthonormal bases in every row and every column as well. But now we have some extra junk here, which uh, to aficionados of certain areas may be recognized as one of the bialgebra laws. If you don't know what that means, which probably almost no one will, don't worry about it. But anyway, there's this extra law here. And this essentially uh, relates to the fact that um, the Latin square is a function on basis states. So it takes basis states to basis states, which clearly the quantum Latin square in general doesn't because it can, it, you can end up with these superpositions. Okay, and so that's a Latin square. And so we can conclude, as I already have anyway, um, that quantum Latin squares generalize Latin squares. Now, mutually unbiased bases, as I've already explained, now, we have two of these before we only had one. We only really need one in the case of mutually unbiased bases because everything here is commutative. Um, but just to make it clear that this is essentially the same axiom, I've, I've written both of these composites in here. And in addition, this white dot needs to be a basis tensor. Now, as I've said before, a basis tensor that, um, that hides a lot under the trunk here. I mean, there's all kinds of axioms you could say about this. It's commutative, it's associative. Um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of structure here, which is extra to do just this. Um, but that means we can see that quantum Latin squares, in this sense, generalize both Latin squares and mutually unbiased spaces. So, so far, everything I've said has been on the level of these quantum Latin squares. We haven't talked about unitary error bases yet at all. But this relationship here is key to how we got our result. So our result is uh, a new construction for unitary error bases, which generalizes two constructions, one which uses a Latin square and one which uses a mutually unbiased basis, a pair of, a pair of mutually unbiased bases. Um, so this is going to be key to how we got our result. OK, so just to make that clear, quantum Latin squares strictly generalize. So this area is inhabited by that example I gave you before, um, Latin squares and MUBs. And this section in the middle, you can imagine something that, that fulfills all of the axioms of both of these. That's perfectly allowable and does exist. Um, so there, there could be something that lies here. But the point I'm trying to make is that our quantum Latin squares generalize these things. Fine, so what? Um, and the so what comes with uh, how we're going to apply these quantum Latin squares to build unitary error bases. So as I said at the beginning, the unitary error bases are a kind of higher order tensor analog of, um, of a basis. And so that specifically, they're a basis with respect to this inner product. So you take the trace of one composed with the adjoint of another, and that has to equal the delta function times the dimension. OK, so in terms of tensor diagrams, what this looks like is if you have this ui here and this uj here, then and you take the adjoint of one, and you trace out, then you should have this delta function. This diagram is not particularly important yet, but will become important later uh, if I get my timings right. So a very famous example um, of a unitary error basis in where n equals 2 is the Pauli's together with the identity. So there's always going to be n squared of these. In this case, it's 4. Um, and in fact, in dimension 2, that's the only unitary error basis that exists. So there's not a lot of interesting um, stuff going on there. That's modulo an idea of equivalence of unitary error bases. Okay. Um, but in other dimensions, things are more interesting. So, so this is um, where the literature is at with uh, unitary error bases. Um, so unitary error bases are um, mathematically encode the information you need to do quantum teleportation and dense coding. Uh, they're used in quantum error correction and tomography. So they have, they have a wide range of uses. So this is why people have studied these things over the years. And um, there were three main constructions before we came along and made this one. So 
Lepong construction, which I'm calling here the Latin square construction. It's strictly not generally called that, but for the purpose of this talk, I think it's easier to call it that. Um, and it's due to Werner in 2001. That construction takes a single Latin square and a family of n Hadamards of order n and builds a unitary error basis out of them. Now we have um, another construction which I'm putting down to folklore. I don't really have a reference for this, but it's certainly out there. Uh, if anybody knows where this comes from, uh, I'd be grateful for you to tell me. But the only input to this is a single Hadamard of order n, which of course is equivalent to a pair of MUBs. So I've called this the MUB construction. Another way of building a unitary error basis is the algebraic construction due to Nil uh, back in 96. This is uh, the oldest and probably best studied of, of these. Um, and you rather different in flavor to these ones. You take a group of order n squared with, I've said a nice representation here, it's a projective representation essentially onto the unitaries. And that gives you um, a unitary error basis as well. So then we have our construction uh, in this paper due to Musto Vickery 2015, um, quantum Latin square construction, we'll call it for now, for want of a better term. Um, so this construction, if you compare it to Werner's here, it takes a quantum Latin square instead of a Latin square and still a family of n Hadamards of order n. OK, so uh, let's do an example of a quantum Latin square uh, basis. If we take our our example quantum Latin square from earlier, which was not a Latin square and certainly not a pair of mubs either. And uh, we take our family of Hadamards to simply be just this repeated um, Fourier transform matrix in, uh, in dimension four here. Uh, so kind of one of the simplest choices you could really make. And we end up with this. Uh, 16 4 by 4 matrices, which I'm sure everybody could just probably look at all of the rest of the way into lunch, but we probably should move on. Um, one thing to note about this is that um, in the Latin square case, uh, we always end up with monomial matrices here. And um, in this case, uh, so monomial matrix is um, a generalization generalization of a permutation matrix. So you should only ever have um, one non-zero number in each row and each column. But now it, in the case of uh, monomial matrix, it doesn't have to be one, as it does with a permutation matrix. It can be anything. But clearly, you know, these matrices are not monomial. And so that's, that's quite a clear difference from the Latin square error bases that you get. And we use this fact in the paper to prove that this particular um, error basis is not uh, not equivalent to any of uh, Werner's type. Okay, so now we have this Venn diagram at this higher level of uh, unitary error bases, but it does um, rest on that first Venn diagram I showed you before. So here we have the error bases which were produced by Latin squares, the ones produced by MUBs, and we have R's that surround them. Now we have this kind of um, algebraic construction. And whether this part of this Venn diagram is actually inhabited or not is still an open question. I'm not sure about that. It's quite difficult to compare the two. Um, but what we do know is that this M, which <coughs> I introduced on the last slide, lies strictly outside of any of the three existing um, constructions before. So um, our example UEB is, is not in LS, MUB, or out. And it's provably inequivalent to anything in any of those. Um, so um, now, why did I bother introducing this kind of language of the tensors? I mean, it, it showed quite nicely that a quantum Latin square was a generalization of a Latin square. That was pretty obvious anyway. We got the mud thing from it. But what I really wanted to do with it was this. Um, I want to show you a fully diagrammatic um, construction for building each of the um, quantum Latin square error bases, the Latin square ones and the MUB ones, to show you um, or give you an insight into how the construction has been generalized. OK, so I want uh, this gray to be an orthonormal basis. As, as usual, this is gonna, we can consider this to be the computational basis. 
um, here. Um, now, H sub J is going to be a family of n Hadamards, and uh, our white dot is going to be a quantum Latin square. Our error basis, our error basis looks like this.